viewer as he joins us on the program. We're now joined by Mr. Adefolari Nolamileko. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. After a while. Yeah, it's a bit final while of the show. Together. Very true. Exactly. Now, now let's get straight into the topic of discussion this morning. One, the challenge is most northern monarchs and leaders and even governors perceive mm -hmm. the current blackout in the country to be a targeted or orchestrated attack. Mm -hmm. Whereas the president this morning has taken it a step further by assuaging their fears and allusions. Mm -hmm. He has now ordered aerial surveillance to speed up the restoration work on the Shiroro Kaduna line. Mm -hmm. In your thoughts, how would you sum up, sum up the large-scale vandalism that has taken place in most northern states? We hear over 140 330 kva power lines have been vandalized in a period of two years it's quite sad that we are experiencing such particular it's not just the northern part of the country it always happened for you know when you first consider the grid collapse they you now consider the 330 kv being vandalized the 130 kv being vandalized the lesser kv being vandalized the 330 kv is a large <coughs> sorry no uh, the one we could normally call a uh, power transporting infrastructure that is one that transits your entire country, picking power from the grid, transmitting it across the country. And it's so sad that uh, it became a target for for some individuals. You know, initially we thought maybe terrorists were attacking those three, three KVA. Then later we discovered that it wasn't just a, a terrorists that were attacking them. It was somehow a sabotaging element within the power sector that is also causing some of the challenges. I remember some few months ago, I think precisely around June, July, one of the K330 KV uh, collapsed, the, 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 the pole, the tower collapsed, and, uh, and uh, TCN came and said it was vandalized. And we discovered that it wasn't vandalized, it was as a result of rain storm that caused it. So in my own opinion, over the years, we have discovered that uh, sabotaging elements are playing this game on the government because I, I, I took a, 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 a very critical review of it and discovered that it could be as a result of opportunity for some people to make money, some people to collect some allowances, and some people to also earn some, uh, you know, stipend from carrying out the repairs on some of those 33 KVA. Because I don't see where a 33 KVA will be destroyed, and that place will not get burnt. I don't know whether you understand. Yeah, but, but, but in terms of destruction, mm. outright destruction and vandalization, mm. it, it almost feels as though those attacking these facilities mm -hmm. attack it with the intent to steal from it, exactly. not outrightly destroy it when they what are they stealing they are stealing the cables so when you cut down a cable that is running a currency that is running the current what will happen Maybe to you most of this vandalization might have been done when those lines were not active nobody a thief will not know a thief a vandalizer will not know when there is current on that trade that KV. if an insider did not give them information a 33 kv drop early this year dropped the line that was a fault it, it dropped into a farm a woman and her son got burnt and died immediately. Talk less of you going to court the 33 KVA that is running current. What I'm trying to point out is that there are insider uh, elements who ensure that this thing work in terms of vandalism, this thing work in terms of stealing, this thing work in terms of uh, destruction of some of this infrastructure. So we should not just say, okay, it was vandalized. Vandalized by who? Well, we know that a 33 KV is running with current. And you can't go there with your cutter or whatever to go and cut it and you know suffer loss. If it's a 33 KV, there's a 33 KV that's running through Asuko, if it dropped, we lost so many houses to, 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 fire, to, to fire. So why, why are we saying that uh, <coughs> uh, the 33 KV, if they will just go there and cut it or they just go there and destroy it? There was a time the authorities were accused, as I earlier pointed out, maybe it was bomb. Even if it was bomb, there will be evidence of fire. You know, if any within that area, because 32 KV is running, if you, the kind of current that is running, voltage, running, voltage that is running is very high. So the government should know, know that Nigerians are interrogating some of this issue. Rather, what the government should do is to see how they can stop and limit some of those internal sabotage within TCN who are jeopardizing the effort of the government. And for the northern part of the country that suffered this, it's not it's not that it's not a targeted issue. It was as a result of the. Uh, uh, people who are interested in cutting off some of those cables. And that is just what we are faced. So the Northern politicians, governors, and the rest of them should... After all, there's an opportunity for them to, to, to generate electricity for their people. What are they still doing with the Electricity Act that, that have been empowered to subnationals to generate electricity? What are they waiting? Since January or February, that, that act has been passing too long. So what are they still waiting for? 
So they are still waiting for the federal government to generate electricity to come in. Meanwhile, there's a law that will empower you to generate electricity and give to your people. So it's now opportunity for many people to look at that angle. You look away from the uh, the aspect that whereby we should be also be relying on TCN for electricity when we have a law that will embellish us, that will empower every state subnational to begin to generate private sector to also come in. So what are they waiting for? So they should not put the blame on a political whether the government is federal government using it to torture them or using it to to what, what there's a language that is being used currently in Nigeria. T pain no, is no. not T pain issue. Now, Chief Bayon Anuga has also talked about the T-Pain issue. And now, <laughs> talking basically about the aerial surveillance, mm. my concern now is the position of the NSCDC. Mm. That we need to have to wait to have this recurrent occurrence of vandalization across many northern states mm. for this aerial surveillance to have been put in place. Mm. What does this do to the efforts on ground? Because we knew that the NSCDC, the amount of budgeted for, exactly. are supposed Public to be the issue, the issue is this. See, there are some sensitive public assets that you don't expect any person with his with his with his uh, right mind or with his full mind or with his that has a correct brain to go and attack or to go and vandalize 32 kV uh, 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 power line. You don't expect that. Even if you, no matter how powerful you could be, no matter how subjugated, when the 32 kV is, there's one that's running through this area that we are today in Yasuko. Any right food person cannot just go there and say, I want to go and cut. Is it the, the aluminum uh, the, uh, 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 tour or is it the cable that you want to go and For what? Something that is running 24 hours, that cable is running currency or current. So, what I'm trying to point out that people who carried out this act are sabotage. And TCN cannot claim that they don't have those elements within them or working for them. As I earlier pointed out, people hope to end allowances. People all hope to end stipends. You mind you keeping engineers that are not doing anything for a long time and they are just collecting salary. They always create opportunity for them to, for themselves to work. So we must look beyond the surface that okay, yeah, it is a vandalism, vandalism. It is not just vandalism. I could also say it is an official vandalism as a result of people who want to earn money from the government. Because a lot of money is budgeted for maintenance and the rest of them. There was one they carried out in uh, Pape, although we understand that the one that happened in Pape about six months ago was as a result of a over over speed by a, a, a tipper a tipper who ran and hit the 33 kva in pape and it took a lot of time before they were able to repair it you get it so we understand that but these ones that run through bushes it means that something is fishing around it and if nsd is not uh, carrying out most of their surveillance around those aspect of a uh, 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 public infrastructure it means that because they're also still thinking that a a cable that is running 24 hours current, no very full individual will go and say, I want to go and cut it. If not that, sabotage have happened. And when they want to do such activities, they off the light or they off the current. So, so, so you think that there's a collusion between the workers and the CCN and those vandalizing They the know. They know about it. On last week, Saturday, there was a uh, participant in one of the discussions around collapse of greed. And those are the things that we pointed out. Even TCN will tell you that we got greed, greed is collapsing because of absolute equipment. Good is collapsing because there is low investment in the area because government need to invest more. Good is collapsing because of uh, uh, some certain infrastructural gap. We now say no, good is not collapsing because of these three factors that TCN is only mentioning low investment, uh, obsolete equipment, and uh, uh, infrastructural gap. It is collapsing because there's sabotage element within the system. What is the grid all about? Many Nigerians are even trying to ask what is this grid? That grid is just a combination of, of where. You wear out all the power that is being generated. Simple. You wear out all the power that is being generated. Then you now use that warehouse to also distribute all the power that is being generated. That's just the grid. And I'm hearing that the government said they want to create super grid. We don't need super grid. There's a law in place that already giving all subnational government private investors to begin to build micro grid, mini grid, as well as macro grid. I hope you get the level. The three levels of grid that can be built at micro level at mini level and at macro level meaning you can do a grid that could just serve a community of 5,000 people or 10,000 people you can also build a grid that could serve 2 million people depending on the capacity and the amount of money to be invested so the, this super grid that government want to go and invest money is going to be a waste of resources because already an act has been passed into law that subnational should begin to generate transmit and distribute electricity for their people so what are they waiting for now, in keeping with more focus this morning on the national grid, earlier we also looked at the publication on the front page of the Daily Independence, which said that.
They're supposed to be guaranteed stable power in Nigeria. And uh, it's in a move that the federal government is looking to establish what it now would call super greed. Mm -hmm. Now, much like you said, you were at that meeting. And beyond the super greed, the Daily Independent is informing us that other issues in terms of alternative power supply, particularly in northern states, are also being considered. Mm -hmm. What is tantamount to a super grid that the power grid currently is not doing? The issue is this. To expand the current grid system that we have and make it more bigger. And we have said it over time that we don't need super grid. There's already an, an act that have also already domesticated... Signed by President Bola. Exactly. Domesticated generation of transmission and distribution of electricity across the state. Imagine FCT generating, transmitting, and distributing electricity. What do they need? What, what kind of super grid do they need? And if you remember, greed was the major challenge that was being pinpointed initially before this Electricity Act was brought into fusion and now it has been signed into law. Because and there was a time, state like Aquaibom, state like River State, state like Lagos State, and state like uh, Edo, we are trying to generate electricity. And what was the law that was available at that time was that if any state generates electricity, if any private investor generates electricity, you must take the electricity to national grid before redistributing before we distributing and the state were like no river state was the first state that kicked it and said no we can't generate electricity and give it to everybody to, to to enjoy no it can't happen and they stopped acquire bond did the same thing Lagos state also has their own it is just recently when this electricity act was now passed everybody was now going back to revive their internally generated electricity so that they can now use it for their people so if government federal government now say we are creating super grid for who okay for all those other states that will be lazy to generate electricity for themselves, so that others say will not come and generate, or a private investor will not generate, take it to national grid, they will not give it to them, then they will not be complaining of a, a no investment, or they will not be complaining non-reflective a tariff. Because the problem is that what this national grid is causing for us is causing a problem of a non-reflective tariff. In the sense that we are somebody is generating so much electricity, you put it to national grid, then they now distribute for everybody. Now when the money now come. They will not give me a pinch of money. Now, after I generate so much, I generate 30 mega, I generate 100, why are you giving me this low? You know, I say, no, they are not paying. And that's one of the key issues that many people have been talking about the investment in the electricity sector in Nigeria because, because of the low, uh, non uh, tariff reflective. And non tariff reflective means that you are generating electricity, you are distributing, but the money being paid for the electricity is very, very small. But it is not because the people are not paying. It is because the way it has been distributed across. You get it? And when money now, when uh, recovering those money now come back, the people who generated the money will not be having issues. And that's why I see that those integrated power generating uh, uh, distribution company that we have and the TCN, they're always having issues of buy bulk of electricity. Because when you buy, you have to pay for it. And before you know, when you, distribute, when you buy and distribute, you don't get enough of it. And that's why we are complaining about the low investment in that sector. Now, let's revisit the front page of the Daily Independent and away from the headline story, which talks about a super greed, which uh, Mr. Alami Lekon disagrees with, is the rider story on a constitution review with a proposal from the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Right Honorable Tajuddina Bass, who is proposing that in the constitution reform, there be reserved seats and joint tickets to enhance equal rights and women participation in elections. Now we're told by this publication that the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Right Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, on Monday said the House will work towards the joint ticketing in election, reserved seats and conferring equal citizenship rights on foreigners married to Nigerian women. He stressed the need to empower women, noting that it is a necessary strategic move for economic growth. Hmm. Now there are three things as captured in this. First off, joint ticketing in elections, mm -hmm. reserved seats for women, and conferring equal citizenship rights on men who are foreigners married to Nigerian women. Let's start with this, men who are foreigners married to Nigerian women. Is this some sort of empowerment? Does this better value the rights of Nigerian women? Does it make Nigerian women the price? Because abroad, you agree with me, you see quite an elderly demographics of foreign women mm -hmm. who younger Nigerian men are willing to marry mm. because of the green card and mm. other benefits accrued. Exactly. Do you I, think that this would somehow be replicated? I, although we can understand it from different contexts. In the context of what 
the shape that the Nigerian home may take, it could be political. In the context of what is happening in Europe, whereby you see younger Nigerians going to marry, it is economic for economic benefit. Although that political is also economic benefit uh, in a sense, but the, for, for us here, yeah, you know, we have a very critical understanding of the Nigerian state and the Nigerian geographical entity as a whole. Those men that are married to our women, are they not enjoying the right they are enjoying? Are they not getting what they want to get? But a critical look of it will look, go to the issue of the political angle of it, whereby maybe they want to create opportunity for foreigners who are married to Nigerians to begin to contest for election, because we have had issues of people from all neighboring countries who now became, they are okay, they are now citizens of Nigeria, they want to contest for election, now become a barrier to them. Maybe by the time they now see the one that are married to Nigerian, it will not be a barrier again. A lot of people will have to look at that critically. And in the developing climate that it happens, it took a lot of sensitization, education, as well as enlightenment for such people to transform to that level. You are married to an American citizen. You don't want to go and contest for election. Before you get to that level of even contest for it, you have, you have to <coughs> enjoy your economic right. The, the system will have checked you out so that you will not be sabotage at the end of the day. But in our own climb, we don't have such system to check people. You get it? So it's a good thing, but I'll prefer that let it just be limited to the economic right of those people. When it becomes political, whereby a foreign now married to a Nigerian woman, then the next day someone to contest for election. And we already have a challenge here in Nigeria. Where if you married, even if I married a woman, and my wife is from Nassau State, by the time she will be given an appointment in Lagos as my wife, People will go and say, no, why didn't you, because we have an issue, you go and you go to our state and collect an appointment, because we have had such issue before. So now you now want to bring another body as a way of political right and the rest of them to some, you know, we have to look at it critically. Not that it's a bad idea, but in the way it is being practiced, they have a way of checking those individuals. But here in Nigeria, we don't have a way of checking anybody. And that's why we have so many intruders claiming to be Nigerians. We have daily occurrence with our uh, young guys that drive bikes, the young guys that drive KK, the ones that are driving, we know we, some of them, they are not Nigerians, they come from another, but we, because of ECOWAS protocols, we have allowed that integration to happen. But we know what they are causing in our community. problem that insecurity. Exactly. So, so we should also not allow such thing to not fit into our political arena, because that is the angle I'm looking at it. I don't know what somebody is looking at, because when you now say you're giving a political right, it means that they cannot contest for election. They cannot be appointed. It cannot be this and that in a political system, then leave a gap. So we have to be very critical in that regard. Then to the other issue of uh, women giving them seats, I know you want to ask. Reserve seats, because uh, this has been a debate, especially mm -hmm. as the world is gearing towards mm -hmm. gender equality mm -hmm. and, and equity, so to mm -hmm. say. If you're not reserving some seats, does that defy the goal of having equal opportunities, the concept of feminism, mm -hmm. uh, the enhanced participation of women mm. in governance and elections uh, does it quite add up in terms of what he is engendering for the women folk it will it will because what we have discovered that all the institutional and cultural barriers have continued to hinder women to get to that rightful position so the only way we can get it done has been done in other climb particularly in rwanda where they reserve over 42 percent in, in namibia they also do the same thing I think also in Tanzania, they also had the same similar laws that allow a particular percentage of seats to be dedicated to women, which is very good. But the concern will now be, at what level are we going to be practical? Because they say it's going to be at the State House of Assembly, going to be at the House of Rep, Senate, and the rest of it. Because where we may have confusion is that, I just hope if the law will take care of this demographic distribution and allocation of this seat, because, for instance, if constituency A, B, A, B, C, out of this ABC, which one will not give his constituency out of us of us of reps? And which one will give those slots? Those slots to women. For women. Or will they be rotating it? If a woman take it this time, then a man take it the next time. Will it be for two term or for just one term? Because we have to define that. Because if we don't define it, some constituency will deny those. They will say light light will never happen in that constituency. So constituency will give the opportunity maybe once or twice. After that, they will stop. Because we have to define the law have to take care of that. For appointment purpose, we, I know that one can be well taken care of. But you know, appointment also throw up some challenges. For instance, uh, I know Nasarawa threw up a, if a female representative to represent them as national as a minister. Initially, it was a man that did that. Other other states also have the same similar arrangement. But some states will stand against them. They don't send such representatives. So 
the law should be able to address some of this. Even though we have an affirmative act of 35% for appointment, which the president, in his own wisdom, have been able to do that through appointment in DG and commission and the rest of them. But in political election, it's going to be very difficult. Because the political party itself, they don't give that room. So the political party must also amend their constitution to allow that to happen. Okay, constituency A, B, C. When you do your own this time around, next time, constituency B we do, then constituency C we do. If that could be put in place in the law, then it will guarantee this gender friendly uh, seat reserve for women. But if we don't have that in place, it will cause confusion for them and it will be very difficult to put bring women on board. Now, the third angle to this proposal by mm. the Honorable Speaker of the House of Representatives mm. is the angle of joint ticketing. Mm. And many refer to some of the recent issues in the Nigerian political mm. landscape. Exactly. Particularly in Edo State, where mm. we saw how the Philip Shuaibu uh, case mm. went with Governor Obaseki, mm. the outgoing Governor Obaseki. Mm. The, the principle of joint ticketing almost seems not to favor whoever deputizes the lead candidate. Mm. You think that by bringing this reform into our constitution, the roles of deputy and the sanctity of their office can be better upscaled? Definitely, because the joint ticketing will, will force and form will amend the constitution. What is the role of the deputy? What is the role of the vice president? Okay, the vice president role is well specified in the constitution because he's the chairman of National Economic Council. There's a role for him. But the governor, deputy governor, don't have a role. They call them spare tire. So by the time we amend the constitution, we may give them a role. Maybe the deputy governor will now become the chairman of the state economic council. Then a specific role will be now be disseminated for the gov deputy governor to be undertaken. Maybe chairman of education, maybe this and that. That will guarantee their function and their duties. But when it is vacuum, when it is open, there is nothing there, they become a challenge. Then in joint ticketing, for me, as well, it's going to be on deputy governors. Maybe we end up having 36 deputy governors <laughs> across the state, across the country at the end of the day, because if the law now permit that women should be the deputy governor or a joint ticket should take place, that means women will not be the deputy governor. But with that guarantee them becoming the governor at the end of the day, it could be in case their boss died or, or whatever, anything, or whether they are impeached or whatever, they cannot become a governor. But joint ticket is a good idea. But we should make sure that we also amend the constitution to also give them roles and duties and function that will be well specified for them to carry. Because we just leave it vo uh, vacuum the way it is presently. They will be there at joint ticketing and they will be called because it will be the spare tire of the sitting governor and the governor can do with them anyhow that he feels. Now, in keeping with more issues as we continue our conversation this morning, it's on what is known as national policy and particularly from the position of Mr. President, mm -hmm. President Bola Metinibu with the tax mm -hmm. reform bill, which this morning more than six newspapers have reports that the northern governors, monarchs and leaders have rejected, kicking against it. But more so, they're looking to prioritize issues of security. There has been a meeting with the CDS. To start with the tax reform bill, mm. one of the worrying, would I call it, clauses is the, mm. the need to increase value-added tax mm -hmm. from 7.5 to 10% in the coming year, mm -hmm. and subsequently 15, 15 12.5, then 15%. No, it, it's not a bad idea to increase VAT. You get it. So far, it's going to be progressive, but... It's a bad idea when the people are not seeing the evidence of the VAT. Because it is state governors and local government that are collecting VAT, as we speak. And for the northern governors, I don't think they are against the VAT. They, they, the VAT. they are only against the, uh, uh, the distribution percentage that is coming up. Because when it is put into law now, federal government will be collecting 10%. Then state government will collect about 90%. That was what was suggested the last time I reviewed the, the new VAT reform that is coming, or the new uh, uh, law that is coming in terms of uh, 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 tax in Nigeria. But the problem is, when the money comes, the allocation to state will differ. You get it? Allocation to state will differ. Because there are no parameters that will be used in sharing the money. I think that's where they are having challenges with the new VAT. Not they are against the increase, but the distribution and allocation of the money when it comes that's why they're having issues. And people have argued if some northern states are not uh, happy with uh, uh, beer, with uh, some alcoholic drink, so why give them the vat that is coming from? Now, now the challenge is mm. with those discrepancies when mm. it comes to alcoholic beverages, mm -hmm. 
Part of the tax reforms also envisioned by President Bola Metinibu has what is known as the National Lottery Trust Fund mm -hmm. four-year master plan. Exactly. There's also the constitutionality where the World Bank has $750 million Nigeria needs to carry out reforms to be able to tap into. Mm. So these are some of the broader perspectives mm -hmm. in mind as well. Mm. Do you think that at this point, beyond the position of the Northern Governors towards issues like uh, excess tax mm -hmm. on this consumables, particularly mm -hmm. alcoholic, mm -hmm. probably might be height signed on the bigger picture of the $750 million that is also in play. The $750 million is a counterpart funding, Federal, State and World Bank. And it's a big loan that at the end of the day, most of the states will have to pay. So it's, a, it's good on one side, but also have its own problem. Because most of this funding, as we call them, most people don't see the evidence of those funding. They will need, also need to ask, what are the funding meant for? You know, the last time some of us discussed about SAP, Structural Adjustment Program. People say, I don't talk about SAP again. There was not even one of those economic, very renowned economists in Nigeria that said we should not be talking about SAP again. And we challenge you, say, no, SAP is still here. It has been remodeled. It has been, the approach to it has been changed. There's what they call structural loans. There's what they call sectorial loans. Now, structural loans will help you to be able to adjust some of the structure and institution in your country. Sectoral loans will also help you to adjust and, I mean, repair some of the uh, institutional gaps in your country. Like this 750 million you are talking about, it could be for structural purposes or for sectoral purposes. Now, if it's for sectoral purposes, let's say human capital, to train workers in local government, to train this and that, who will see the evidence of such money? It could be for another sectoral loan that, okay, put this money in the power sector, which is good, but evidently, when are we going to see those changes in those areas? So we must understand some of this money that the World Bank and the rest of them give. There's one money they're already collecting by state called ACRIMA, Agricultural Res uh, Resilience for semi agric Land, uh, Agricultural Climate Change for semi agric Land. The money has been given to state to take care of areas that they know that climate change is affecting farmers. How many states have collected that money? What are they? Have you seen evidence of such money? I knew of National State because I followed up, I did a report on that particular agriculture, and I knew they are distributing using the money to buy some equipment, buying some, but it's, yet it's not enough. Many people don't even know about it. It is done across states. I said states that are not interested to collect that money. The same thing could be at this 750 million US dollar. It could be for a particular sector that they'll collect the money, they'll bring down counterpart funding, and they'll carry out those projects. But when will the people see the evidence of those money, that's where we have challenges with some of this money coming, of, coming from this British Wood Institution. For, either for structural purposes, or for stabilization purposes, or for sectoral purposes. Now, the other angle is the issue of a uh, lottery fund and the rest of them. You know, government is looking for many ways to tap and to get revenue. And across developed countries, lottery is one of those areas that government make money from. It could be a fund coming for the government. Everybody will play the calocala. So normally call it in local language. You play the draft, you play the number, whatever. If you win, good for you. Get some millions of naira. If you lose, the money will also be, you, you lose that. So those are the aspects. But there are some cultural and religious practice that are against lottery. So anywhere that is against lottery, definitely lottery will not strive. It will only strive where it is being permitted. And when revenue come to national posts, don't expect you that you are against such thing to, to partake. Just like what we said in, in the VAT issue. People state that are against alcohol or some beverages that are against. When a VAT comes, now a law is coming. If you know you are against it, you will not partake in the, in the, in the revenue. And that's what the law is trying to pinpoint. So I just hope that they can have an understanding around it. And for me, I don't see, I don't see the Northern uh, governors rejecting or the traditional... No, they are not rejecting the, uh, the, the new tax law. What they are just trying to point out is the quality in their location and distribution. But we know that that can be addressed by the government. Now, there's also the position of the Northern uh, governors and leaders on mm. al a number of out-of-school mm. children. In some of the reforms in terms of national policies, they're mm. also calling on the federal government to address that issue. But like you said, some cultural opinions or biases mm. continue to aggravate the issue of prioritizing education in the northern part. What are some ways the federal government can further intensify education and deal with the out-of-school children, especially in the north? I'm so sad that governors from the north are talking about Almajuri. Is it federal government that created Almajuri? It is their responsibility. The, 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 the concurrent list that they jointly work on education is for both of them. I'm so sad that to the point that the federal government is even creating a majority commission. These are responsibilities of nationals. And how are these things being generated? A lot of us have done a bit of research. 
on this Almighty thing. It is just a mindset. It is not even religion. Seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on national TV. It is not even religion. It is just the mindset of the parents and the communities to have such uh, among themselves. You get it? So, I have good, I'm a Muslim. I have good Muslim friends from the north, from Aosa Fulani, who never went through Al Almajiri stuff. Or some of them went through it. But when they tell you their stories, you know that one number one is poverty. That is number one weeks factor about it. Then number two, they tell you the mindset of their parent. The belief system of people within that area. It's not it's not because uh, uh, Islam no Islam didn't even propose that in a way that it will not become a challenge to the society. It is just the mindset of people practicing it. You get it? And they have to correct it by themselves. At the time the government created and Majorian school put billions of naira, this new government with Boy government passed a law into place to make sure we have the Majorian Commission. So and the Almighty Commission also work with the state. So what are the state governors? This state governor left undone this issue of Almighty. They leave it for federal government. This is the federal government. And meanwhile, the problem is from their state. The people who are creating this problem, having those children, send them to one cleric to go and learn uh, 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 Islamic uh, uh, knowledge from the, those clerics. They leave them like that. See, they are, some of those children will be there till maybe they are off for 15, 16 years. Then they will now come back to their family. And if they don't see anything to do, they go into the society. Most of them are the ones that are riding by or pushing the uh, uh, care of the rest of them. Because that's how it, it operates. Moment a child goes there from age of six, seven, eight, by the time he's 15 years mature enough, he will go back to his family. Now, if you get back to his family, he didn't see anything to do, he will find his way. Some of them will go and learn trade. I met some of them in universities. They came to university. They had the opportunity to go, to go and learn trade. They are working, they are selling things, and they enter university. We all got it together. Now, they are doing very fine. But if those ones did not have the understanding that they need to further the education, they will remain uh, so, 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 so bad and become a challenge to the society. But what are the state governors doing? They have to take it up upon themselves. It is not a federal government problem. It is state that's supposed to handle that. So they should not put it on the federal. I wish I'm a, so, a, one of the presidential spokespersons and respond to this issue on my. It is their responsibility. The federal government have created a commission. Work with the commission and talk to the cleric who are also taking advantage of those children. To, 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 to exploit them and to exploit them because we have seen it practically. There was a research carried out by a colleague of mine who was doing his PhD in sociology and he did extensive work on the magic. And we were able to understand that this is how it is being practiced. Those children come from nowhere, they come into the city, they are assigned to a particular cleric, and the cleric could be accommodating them, put them, they will sleep in the mocks or provide a room for them. And they'll be there in the morning by 7 30, 8 o'clock, those children will run out, go and look for food. Before 12, they are back. Then they will begin to recite. By 6 in the evening, they are out again. Before 8, they are back. And when they are back, they sit down there, they sleep. They, that's how they do their routine. Every day. But when they get to the age of 15, 14, 16, the clerk can't take care of them again. So they have to leave. By that time, they already finished their studies. They go back. And there's no technical skills attached to some of this learning. And that research that my, that my colleague did, one of the solutions, one of the recommendations were, Technical skills should be attached. Those clerics should liaise with technical colleges in state and local government, whereby those children will not just be learning uh, Quran alone, they will be learning skills. There was a time that someone made a proposition within Asa State that those children, when, although it's also exploitative, then they send the children out, they'll be looking for empty cartons. They'll be gathering empty cartons and they'll be selling it and they'll be saving that money for themselves. But recently I discovered that those children, they don't do that again. Maybe they have issues. You get it. So what I'm trying to point out, this challenge of Almagri is a state problem, no federal government. No. Federal government have only intervened and it has and it has spent billions of naira. And most of those money that you see, you don't see them evidently. So it's so painful. I say mostly it's so painful that this has now become a national embarrassment. And they know that this is the problem. They knew the root of the problem. So it's not a it's not a religion, it's just the mindset of the people who don't want things to be done rightly. Now, very vehement calls from uh, Mr. Alami Leko Adifolarin this morning as it concerns the Almagiri and out-of-school children situation. And he said, far be it from the situation where it's blamed on religion, it is about mindsets and norms in certain societies and cultural groupings where these children prioritize Islamic knowledge over skill or even forging their education. Let's refer back to the Nation newspaper and its publication this morning and give you more insight as to the Almagiri situation and the position of northern leaders and governors. Earlier published on The Nation is the headline story. 
North's leaders reject VAT plan. Okay, livestock reform security. NSGF six equity fairness in implementation of national policies programs. There's also a quote beneath that headline story, and I'll read it. It says, Forum agrees to support and key into any initiatives aimed at addressing the challenges of out-of-school children and improving educational outcomes, unquote. Now, political leaders and traditional rulers of the North have rejected the value-added tax VAT, sharing proposals in President Bola Metinibu's tax reform bill being considered by the National Assembly. The leaders are said to have expressed support for the Livestock Reform Program, which has led to the creation of the Livestock Development Ministry. They are also delighted with the gains made in the battle against bandits and terrorists in the region in recent times. They made their positions known yesterday at a meeting of the Northern State Governors Forum, NSGF, and the traditional rulers in the three geopolitical zones, Northwest, Northeast, and North Central, led by the Sultan of Sokoto, Sa'ad Abubakar III. The president a few days ago, it will be remembered, sent an executive tax reform bill to the National Assembly for consideration with the comprehensive outlay of the tax plans bill to go into effect from January 1, 2025, targeted at taxing the upper class who earn more than the middle and lower class. The VAT is planned to improve luxury items increased to 15% with the tax items currently pegged at 75%. But the governors and northern state councils of Emir and chiefs said that the new arrangement on tax sharing is against the interest of the north. Now, some of the issues we might have not <laughs> highlighted is the fact that uh, the northern states governors forum mm. are quite delighted with the livestock ministry reforms. Mm -hmm. They're also talking about issues of insecurity as well. Exactly, because it has happened that the recent result before we are hearing is that things are working for good in terms of security. And the livestock uh, 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 initiative of the president is one of those resolutions that many people believe that to end farmers' elders' crisis, particularly as going to make it more robust, more innovative, and more enduring that uh, people will be engaging in that area so now know that this is business for them, not just any how thing they will be running. So many people are happy about it. And the institution that will be coming up to also safeguard that uh, initiative People are happy that it's going to work. And you can also see that uh, it's like a favorable institution for the North. So definitely everybody from the North will be happy that it is an institution. Just like NDDC that is specialized for the Niger Delta people, livestock will be an advantage to all Nigerians, but specifically the North will benefit from because they are the ones dealing with livestock, particularly cattle and sheep. Good, we are in and the rest of them. But, but Mr. Olamile, despite this livestock mm. development ministry, mm. the National Assembly on its own is mm. still having issues with coming to a conclusion on the debate proposing an end to open grazing mm. and the establishment of ranching system in Nigeria. It, 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 it's, a step, it's one of those steps that we need to take to end grazing. You can't just do it, uh, you know, in a swap way. It has to be gradual, it's step by step. If an agency come on board, if a ministry come on board and begin to initiate guideline, national guideline on how <coughs> such business will be carried out, then everybody will begin to key in. Just that you need a lot of education, you need to a lot of sensitization, you need a lot of uh, enlightenment. I, I live in a in natural state where I stay. I live in a rural community where we have others, we have farmers all living together. The community itself gives them rules on how to operate. You don't enter anybody's farm anyhow. You don't move in the night. You get it? They are already giving them the rules and regulations on how to operate. So if the national guideline now comes on board, definitely it will guide everybody on how to operate. So it's a, it's, a, it's a step by step before we get to the level that we want to get to. It was the initial policy that was to be initiated under Buhari, region called Ruga. When it came, everybody saw it, saw it as a suspicious policy. That's why people kick against it. But this one that is coming, is coming gradually. It will be unfolding most of the initiative, most of the law. Gradually, people begin to understand. And the owners of those cow who, who give those cow to those others to be managing for them, gradually they will begin to be to begin to understand how to carry out such businesses as we go forward. So it's a, it's a step by step. So we should just uh, agree that this one is one step, next step will come, another step will come before we get to the level that everybody wants to believe that, okay, livestock and the rest of them will become something of a greater advantage to the Nigeria economy. Like the president said, you want to stop a situation whereby Nigeria will be importing milk or some dairy product over 1.5 uh, billion US dollar, 1.5 trillion naira that he made mention 
last week when they had that conference. So it's, it's, it's a good direction that we need to take. So we must welcome the development as we go forward. Well, Mr. Lamilekon says it's a welcome development in terms of the Livestock Development Ministry and what it pretends for the three geopolitical zones in the north, the northwest, north central and north east. But particularly more on the debates on the tax reform bills with luxury items and the bias from those three ge geopolitical regions. Now let's look at some other issues of the economy as captured on the Business Day newspaper revisiting the front page. We'd find the headline story, Nigeria's GDP rebasing. What it means beyond the number is the headline story. Now, it's one of those stories that takes us all the way back to 2014 when Nigeria made a global headline in what the economy declared at its largest uh, gross domestic products surging by 89% uh, back then in 2014 to $610 billion and the transformation that was to come as a result of rebasing. Now, the process of updating the base year used to be a calculation mm -hmm. on what the nation's GDP would be in the coming years. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Are we on track? Are we losing steam? Mm. W what is happening to our productivity level in spite of our GDP? I, I think the major thing is to look at the real GDP, the actual GDP, and the official GDP. You know, when we say real GDP, actual GDP, and the official GDP, the real, I mean, the reality on ground. The actual is the fact, the real fact. Now, the real and the official can always come together. The actual fact will never come to, will never in, will never be in line or be in tune with the real and the official. Because the real and the official is what government will be working on. That's what we hear from NBS. But the actual is the daily occurrence of what is happening to our productivity. All the seven key sectors and the rest subsectors and the rest many sectors across the country. So what is happening to them? We have to look at it. And when we want to look at those sectors, we have to look at it. what is the functionality of the energy sector in the entire economic spec? Because it is energy that boosts GDP. If your energy is very poor, your GDP will be very, very poor. But if your energy is very strong, your GDP will be very strong. When we talk about it, we're talking about electricity power supply. We're not talking about other infrastructural issues that help GDP to grow. We can't talk about industrialization today without talking about power. You can't talk about industrialization today without talking about logistic road network. You can't talk about industrialization today without talking about transportation system, air system. They cannot talk about security. They cannot talk about human capital. So what has happened to all this that we have mentioned has a greater effect on your GDP. If you like, base it one trillion times. The actual will always convince people who understand how this thing works. Because when people say we are rebasing our GDP, even 2014 that we did it, did that rebase it. A lot of us criticize and say, it is not in actual form because it was just the calculation of the numbers that will suit and appeal to international investors and international bodies to say, yes, the economy is doing very, <coughs> sorry, doing very fine. But in real fact, in actual fact, the economy is not doing anything. Yeah, maybe just hold your thoughts for a mm. bit. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, you'll pick up from the GDP rebasin. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to ADBN's Morning Express, a Tuesday edition as we look at issues in the news and particularly as published on the front pages. Before the break, our in-house analyst, Mr. Adefolario Lami Lekon, who also, beyond being a public affairs analyst, is an astute economist, was looking at Nigeria's GDP rebasing and he talked about what the actual GDP is and where we are in terms of projection. And no matter how fancy it looks on papers with projections, if we don't have our actual GDP on check, we'll revisit this conversation and continue rebasing as much as... Uh, <laughs> yes. Even 1,000 years from now. Uh, and the issue based on, uh, you know, one of those criteria that most investors, international bodies like IMF, World Bank, or the development institutes always look out for, what uh, foreign portfolio investors look out for, what the likes of uh, Golden Sachs and the rest of those international bodies, particularly the kind of numbers, the kind of data they want to read from you. So that's what all these things, why it comes into being. So Nigerians must also join the rank. You must tell them what you are doing. You must, whether it is actual, whether it is real, whether it is official, they must hear. So they use that to judge. And when we now say we are doing rebasing, we are actually calculating the productive level in Nigeria. We look at all these key sectors, which you call the real sector. We look at the subsector. We also have the subset sectors. Down to the mono, uh, I mean, what you call the... Uh, the, uh, in, uh, informal sectors because if they are all part of the GDP calculation 
But in our own case, we have not been able to arrive at calculating those informal sector and add to the GDP. But we are still looking at the major ones that I see happening from the manufacturing to the power sector to the aviation to the financial institution to the insurance. Those are the major ones, food and beverages that we know. Those are the ones that we just calculate what they are doing, numbers of uh, uh, rating in terms of what is happening in the stock exchange, what is happening in terms of fat, uh, capital income to the country. Those are the things that we calculate. And when we put all this together, we discover that we can have a GDP. But the real fact remains that it doesn't show the real action of productivity. What are we producing? What are we exporting? Because the two things that developed countries we have used to judge their GDP, what are they exporting? As against what they are importing. Now, for Nigeria's case, the exportation largely is uh, raw crude. Raw crude and some agricultural product and some. The agricultural value chain, I would say, has not even been. Uh, the value addition hasn't been done. It's we are, expo we are exporting crude. leather. Raw leather from raw, raw leather from. Well, what, what we'll be thinking at this point, we should mm. have incentivized to get our factories running on board mm. so that we can be able to export finished goods as well. I think that's what the government is trying to do in terms of mines and mines and development. They don't want to be exporting all the raw stone, all the precious whatever material they're getting from the ground. Over 42 different items have been gotten from the ground in Nigeria. They don't want to be exporting it raw again. They want to see how they can develop it. That's why they say that they want to create a mines and development fund. Mm for people in that sector. But the issue still remains that GDP is not as we want it to be because we are importing. We are high dependent nation import. And when a country is an high dependent importing nation, if you are calculating and rebasing their GDP, you are just doing the the real and the official that people want to hear. But the actual one is missing. What is not happening to your unemployment gap? What is happening to your human capital development? These are the things you use to rate if the GDP, because although the government is also trying as much as to develop skills, but uh, when I saw the numbers of skills that uh, ITF, they say they are trained 29,000, I said 29,000 people in one year, four out of millions of people who need their skills. And what kind of skills are we even giving them? They also have the ICT training, they say they are training over I mean, 500,000 people in ICTs. And I wonder what skills are we even giving them? The app application, app development. The way the real skills is how to develop the, the issues. To develop those products themselves, not just to become a keyboard warrior and begin to amplify those products. The product himself, AI that will speak today. How I many? What is the government doing in the area of AI development? The product of AI himself, not just to go and begin to manipulate AI. You get it? You can manipulate, you can do, but the product that gives back to that product. What are you doing about it in, in terms of skills development? Now, the federal government has also received an advice on the current projections in terms of. Mm. unemployment and mm -hmm. job losses mm -hmm. owing to what many say is the poor implementation of the removal of fuel subsidies policy. In reversing the situation, mm. the government over time has tried some palliative measures. Mm -hmm. Many Nigerians continue to blame the failure of this uh, policy on the lack of implementation of CNG initiative. Mm -hmm. Be beyond this, how does the federal government avert this massive job loss with a mm. review of the policies in question? Uh, the policies are just new. We can't Actually, put to figure the number of people that have lost the job as a result of the press social remover or the floating of the net because it's still ongoing. It's still an emerging policy that is still affecting here, affecting there, impacting here, impacting there. So, if anybody putting out the figure that you know, two million people have lost their job, see, it is still continuing as it stands right now. Floating of the net is still on that the currency floating, uh, 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 the implementation of the social remover is still on. So, they are still an emerging thing that. Bringing up so many impact on the economy. Anyway, before now, we have had series of challenges that have led to unemployment in Nigeria, which many of us are now paying attention to. Number one of these is that the productive sector have not been well competitive. See, one of the areas that government can really empower and generate jobs is that government is not participate competitively in businesses that are producing products, not just offering paper services. Because what we have majorly as government businesses is paper services, monitoring agencies, evaluating agencies, regulatory agencies. What about the one that is productive? Do you know that if the four refineries of the NNPC of the federal government is working, do you know how many petrochemical subsector that will come out of that area to generate jobs, including services that provide provision and the rest of them? 
We are not looking at that area because the government is not competitive in terms of businesses. It's leaving the competitive businesses for business uh, for the private sector. They don't have to maximize their profit. They don't employ much. They only outsource their, some of their services to people they know that at the end of the day it's consulting their pay, it's consulting fee they are paying. But when government itself remain competitive in the economy, remain competitive in the business sector, it will give opportunity for employment generation because even the government will be doing it at what they have accused government of low margin because no margin means the government is not out in that business to make profit, but to ensure that welfare service is provided for the people. And people have so called not to feel the so much impact from the private sector in terms of their pricing. And that's why government have to be in the business. But that the case is reverse in Nigeria. But we just hope that the competitiveness of government in business will help us to accelerate employment generation. Not just leaving to the private sector. Either. Because private sector will tell you, ah, they will just, I'm an economist, political economist. But for that matter, critical one because I don't just look at policy and talk at the surface of it. I look beneath and look, I project issues that will arise as a result of that policy in 10 years, in 20 years' time. So that's how political economy look at the policy. But when the say, Oh, do we leave employment generation for yes, you can generate, but you cannot generate as much as if government is competing with you in that same sector. I don't know whether you, you get. Get what I'm trying to point out. I, I do agree with you on mm. these projections in terms of the long term mm. benefits and the long term effects on both the citizens mm -hmm. and the economy, as it were. Mm. The former lawmaker representing Kaduna Central mm -hmm. in the Red Chambers, Senator Shewusani, uh, took to his ex handle much like he has done over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told President Bola Metimibu that uh, regardless of these projections over time, mm. the citizens should not die. Whilst we say we don't know the numbers of those who have lost their jobs mm -hmm. in terms of the cost of living crisis and how mm -hmm. many people can afford uh, balanced diets mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Nigeria, he says people should not die before some of the benefits of these policies are seen to be working in Nigeria. Definitely, he's, he's right. Uh, Senator Sani is very, <coughs> sorry, he's very right to call for that. But the issue still remains that it has to be a collective effort. If government is doing a particular policy, you get it. There are some policy that will, that, will, that will come in and like the social mover as well as the floating of the era, they did some damages to the economy. But there should be an obs ob 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 uh, another policy that will absorb some of those damages. That's what we are lacking. You get it? In policy trust, you should expect that there will be challenges with a particular policy. It will bring its positive, it will bring it gains, but know that it's going to dis dispose some policies. Like the floating of the era, as well as the road, they dispose some policy of government. One of the policies they disposed was that the transportation policy of the government was nowhere critical to help to ameliorate the challenges of fair subsidy. Then on the other side of uh, removing uh, floating of the Naira, the monetary policy of the government was nowhere critical to ensure that when we are talking about floating Naira or doing an exchange rate, we should also look at whereby we can safeguard local production. But that is missing. Now, now in, talk, in terms of the, the bid to unify the Naira, mm. because uh, a, a number of your colleagues who I spoke to, mm. when that policy came up and the federal government said we're looking to remove the exchange rate cap mm -hmm. and float the Naira in a mm -hmm. bid to unify the exchange rate both at the parallel market, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. the investor exporter window, mm. that challenge became even more daunting after eight months where mm. a number of persons applauded the move to give the BDCs a controlled rate, mm -hmm. but now we have the Naira dollar exchanging at over 1,750 Naira per Naira. Mm -hmm. Would you say that policy has some assault? The policy went back to the normal jack and trade that we normally have. Because when that policy came, I was one of those that wrote an article and said, we need a sound productivity to be able to bring this kind of thing. So we agreed that we need to cut off about 1,100 official rate was happening in Nigeria. And one of those 1,100 official rate was at the port of entry, there was a different rate that port of entry were using to exchange naira to dollar when you are importing. There was a different exchange rate. Now, Nigerian businessmen who are doing business among the say they bank the financial they also have their own different rate. When the government they say they want to unify everything. Now, unification has not helped because unification are now bastardized. I've now gone back to the usual way that what we think that we want to correct, it has not been left open. Because there is no strong political and economic way to get this thing done. Now, when the government says, okay, we are unifying all the exchange rates, why give 41 item to now also continue to say you are going to be giving them free dollar to be important? That was one of the critical issues that we quickly said, no, you are going back to the same issue. 
We want to the pharmacy being gone now restricted this item. Now you are now saying okay, this item you should come back to the floor and begin to collect few dollars. Meanwhile, five years ago, six years ago, those when they restricted those items not to receive dollar, not to get dollar from the official government quarter, they were now helping local production. But all of a sudden, you now say okay, they can now come back and begin to do importation. Why won't there be pressure on the Naira? The 41 items they were now back. With the other major items that will be collecting dollars, all of them are now back. Now looking like a with somebody, one of my friends described it as a, a dollar shark on CBN uh, neck. They are now became a dollar shark on CBN neck because all of them want dollar. So why would it be pressure in there? And there's no amount of uh, exchange that CBN want to tag because what we are doing is tagging. We are just tagging it 1,600, 1,500, depending on how much defense CBN want to do. Last week, CBN spent over 16 million US dollars to defend the Naira. And what did they do by that defend? They were giving out people dollar so that they can import. Because the majority of this dollar that you are seeing that is going out of the CBN is for importation. So why don't we carry that a reform that will help us to limit our importation and help local industries to function? Although the policy of the government is that let us leave it because the free market thinking, if it's a fiscalist thinking of the uh, President Tunu, because Mr. President Tunu is a fiscalist, he's not too monetarist. It's a physical, you believe in uh, generating, bringing tariff and the rest of them. I wish is someone that have that combination of physicalist and monetary understanding. You will be able to safeguard the Nigerian productivity sector. This is GDP, GDP we do, we that we are doing. It's just a ceremony. The GDP we do, we will now fall back to productivity. Those 41 items will be suspended. Furniture, all those uh, things that we know that locally we can produce through our local cottage industry, they would have helped them because what the government is lacking as I speak right now, they are not supporting local production. I'm not saying giving people money. The way all these people are shouting, give us money. Like uh, oil importers yesterday were talking about uh, energy bank. I kick against it on the sister station. I said, no, we don't need energy bank for oil importers. They want to be collecting free money. They, have, they know that there's no way for them to collect free dollar again because they have stopped importation of PMS. Now they want to collect. We don't need it. So not giving money to manufacturers. You are giving, no, support them. Create an enabling environment. Let the energy supply be thick and accessible. Let the transmission system be better off. Let the aviation sector also be better off. Let agricultural product be linked to our productivity. They will have a safer Naira and a best currency. Then, you know what the government did recently? You know, most of us are kicked against borrowing money from, uh, from international bodies. You know what they are doing? They are now just at the IMF meeting over the weekend. CBN has signed a pact with IFA, International Financial Corporation. Now they are giving them about one billion US dollar to do what? To support the Naira. Well, we'll come back to this conversation in a bit. It's about time for us to take another break so we can intimate you with the foreign newspapers and headlines from tabloids from across the globe. When we come back, we'll turn our attention to the independent strike action as occasioned by four months withheld salaries and the aggrieved unions on the Sanwa Nasu who have embarked on a nationwide strike. We'll also be looking at uh, some reshufflings in terms of the ministerial appointments and what the education sector stands to benefit from the appointment of a new minister of education. Stay with us. Well, these are the many stories on the foreign newspaper review segment. And uh, coming back into our studios, would we'll also rejoin the conversation with our in-house analyst, and I will look at the education sector from mm. two perspectives. One, the impending strike with Sanu and Nasu being forced to close varsities across Nigeria. And uh, the National Association of Nigerian Students, NASC, is asking the federal government to resolve the crisis. The federal government has extended invitations to the unions, but it's still on the catch of no work, no pay. Mm. Now, Mr. Adefolari, this dispute has lingered over a long time, dating mm -hmm. back to when ASU itself <clears throat> embarked on a strike. Exactly. But in solidarity, Nasu and Sanu joined. But up until date, four months of withheld salaries form part of the reasons why these unions are aggrieved. Let's get your thoughts. Uh, definitely, on this. they will be aggrieved. They expected that salary to be paid. And uh, I think the problem right now is not that the salary, the federal government is not saying they are not paying. The processes has been on you just that they are just waiting for the disbursement of the money to those workers but on the other hand is to also say that the law that say no work no pay is not working in nigeria you know it's not working in nigeria anytime unions go on strike like that after their strike once they resume work the salaries will pay even though it may be delayed but we pay 
But the question to ask is that what are the issues that is making workers to go on strike? Why is that incessant strike by unions in our education sector is still on? Over the years, there have been you know strategic move by government, by stakeholders in those sectors to really put in the new in 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 in, 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 in uh, the challenges that is causing those strike. How come that we have not yet overcome those challenges? How come that we are still battling with the union going on strike? And uh, people like us, I was in University of Abuja yesterday for a program, and uh, I saw a skeletal work in in that school. You know, one of the things that they use in paralyzing. The act activity in that school was that the workers on that side, the Nasu, would normally take care of maintenance. They refuse to own the gen. <laughs> they refuse to buy electricity. So we have to rely on the uh, alternative source of energy to be able to do what we ended to do yesterday. So what I'm trying to point out now, the question is need to be asked, what is foiling crisis in the education sector? Is it about wages? Is it about uh, uh, salaries of workers? Or is it about infrastructure? Or is it about curriculum that has been taught in the school? Because we have to wait. You get it? A lot of time, the one that push the, the narrative that many people get to know is that it's about ah, salary, they are not being paid, they are not like this current one. And Nasu is Nasu, who is Nasu? Who is Nasu? Nasu is the non academic staff, you know, when the senior staff are academic uh, union of universities, you know, comprise senior management staff. They are not academic staff both on both sides. On both sides, they are not academic, they are just senior staff and the, the non teaching staff. But the teaching staff, like when I was in the university, they were available. Lectures were still holding. I see, see two, three, four lecture or maybe few the students having attended to the lecture. But when it comes to the general teaching work, it's skeletal. That as in of Abuja. But where I found a little bit uh, not too comfortable with the union, the joint tax union, it was that they are now asking states to join them in the strike, which I say no, this is a federal government issue, and they should leave state out of it. I remember state join it. The state. Uh, uh, sector will begin to create problems for them. So because state governors are, are, the one, are the one paying their salaries. The moment you go on strike, some of those state governors are not ready to listen to any issue because they'll tell you it's a federal government issue and they are about to say, well, so why join them in the strike? So the union should be, the ta tax force should be a little bit, you know, temperament in when they call out for such, because they have to be very critical. You get the force. Also from some of us that have the background of unionism, background of uh, industrial training and the rest of them. We knew when the, when the upstate come when you call for joint strike, when you call for you know, you know, industrial action against the government, but not all the time. Like this particular four-month issue, it can be resolved. After the government have said the payment is in, in process, it's just disbursement, disbursement that is left, you get it. So, but the critical question still need to go back to, what is foiling industrial action in our universities? Is it about salaries? They are claiming there is not enough, or there is enough, they need more? Is yeah, about correct? talk about the IPPIS system of payments as well. No, the other one that is those are infrastructural issues that have been settled. NASU is not having issue with the uh, IPPIS. It's teaching staff that have issues with IPPIS. And I was told that the, that the reason why they're having issue with IPPIS is because of uh, you know when a professor goes on sabbatical, IPPIS will cut off your salary. You can't collect salary from two people. One of the key goals of IPPIS, you can't collect salaries in more than one place. So if you're going on sabbatical, in one university, no stipend will be paid. Or something. So IPPI will cut you off. It will only be paying you your salary that you are earning. And if you also go on appointment level, it is half salary that you go you'll be earning. So IPPI is taking up that one. But the issue is that some professors some senior le learning individual in the academy they can do three, four uh sabbatical in, in some universities. So they will be earning so those are the aspects they have issues with. But for non-academic studies, they don't have a problem with IPPIS. They are already on IPPIS. But the aspect I'm asking is that what are the other things apart from salaries, wages that is causing uh, industrial action? Is it about infrastructure? Telephone has been doing enough. Building infrastructure across universities. Is it that it, it, those infrastructure are not enough? Is it the curriculum that is a challenge? So those are the things. We, so when, like, uh, the current issue that I, I asked is tackling with the federal government 2009 agreement, and they said, uh, 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 recapitalization and revitalization and so many terminologies that were put in place to look at the need assessment of investors. And over the years, billions upon billions of naira has been released for the need assessment of investors. So what are we still talking about? So the issue is, what is the real problem? As I said, I've been mentioning it. Is it about infrastructural gap? Is it about the curriculum? Or is it about salaries and wages? Because in the health sector, you discover that when they say they are going on strike, you discover that the bottom line is about uh, 
There is this particular template they use in paying salaries in so 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 country. They want it to be implemented in Nigeria. That's why I have normally have issue with health workers when they say they are going on strike. And there's a huge particular uh, that what they want a uniform international uniform payment of salaries of or allowance of health workers or whatever. But they have voting that there is a cultural I and mean, uh, uh, social cultural and social economic template or ecosystem of a particular country that just oppose our salaries wages to be paid. And that's why when this argument comes on the round table, when political economists are talking about international capitalism, it can never be equal when it comes to salaries. But it can, they will always call for equality when it comes to policy implementation. And when that policy implementation is to safeguard the capitalists, to get them more accumulation of salary, but when, uh, of more capital. When it comes to the, the ones that concern workers, it is not always done. So that argument has always been, although uh, 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 that argument has always been on the table, but I know that supposed to be living in this perspective is not fun. So, for Nigerians, what is the causes or the reason why we normally have industrial action in Nigerian universities or in Nigerian institutions? Is it about the salaries or wages? Is it about the infrastructure gap? Or is it about the curriculum we are using to teach the students? Now, now over time, the governments, successive governments have been accused of not prioritizing education enough, even in terms of the budgetary provisions for education. Mm. Do you allude to this? The issue is that when you say budgetary allocation to education, in the budgetary of all universities, which one is the I is it the capital project or the recurrent aspect? Yeah, expenditures. It's the same thing at the federal. The way all those agencies would normally say, okay, uh, money is, there is no money that will ever be enough. I don't know whether there is no money that you can give to human for any assignment that will never be enough. Because as we are collecting that billions upon on Naira, we are collecting billions of dollars. As we are going to the field to carry those, you are seeing emerging threats, risks that is coming up. That you need to take care of. So when you are saying there is no enough money being put to education, me I normally smile and say, okay, the, because I've already understood there is no enough of money that you can put to education that will ever satisfy anybody. And the problem is this: the aspect of that money they are talking about is the one that take care of the wages and salaries, is the one that take care of the allowances, but the one that will take care of the actual issues in the education sector, nobody fight for it. Nobody fight for it. So we must be able to uh, uh, dissect this issue on the aspect that. What is the real problem? So if anybody is saying hey, the money is not enough, I normally spy because I will respond and tell you that there is no money that you can give that will be enough. Let's put the issue of money. We know that money is very is important. But what are the priority again? Apart from just there is no more money and hey, the money is not enough. The budget allocation is not enough. And when you look at this, just oppose this budget allocation, it's called that the one that will go for salaries and is always very taken care of. But the one that will go to the issues that we need to address. Nobody take, talk about that one. Nobody look at that particular. Now, let's look at some of the issues in terms of reforms in the education mm. sector mm. that were envisioned by now, I don't want to use the word sacked, mm. but now relieved of duty, mm. former education minister, mm. Professor Tahir Maman. Mm. Now, some controversies where a lot of persons ask, where did he get it wrong? Because mm. on paper, it seemed as if he had brilliant reforms for the education sector. But the one controversial issue that kind of threw him under the bus mm. was the 18 years age for entry into the university. I think part of that stemmed from the disagreements across board. Mm. In your perspective of the last 16 months under Professor Tahir Maman and the envisioned changes for the education sector, how would you score him? And do you think that his removal from office was indeed justified? For me, I think there was poor management on his poor communication management on his part. He never had a good communication or information team that worked with him. And so sad that uh, most of us advice, but the advice was not taken. One was that the people in charge of Ministry of Education, the information department, they work, they work contrary to what the ministers was doing in terms of public engagement, public communication. And that's what led to that row between 18 years, 13 years. That was this that policy has been in place for, for, for many years. You get it. So in terms of rating him, I don't think he performed poorly. He never performed poorly. I think we had one of the seasons whereby industrial action on the Ministry of Education was not that uh, elongated. It was quite managed because he was also part of ASU, we've been a professor in law and was able to manage and a former vice chancellor for that matter. So he was able to manage that aspect of uh, industrial action. But where we normally have issue in this ministry is uh, information and communication. If you don't have a strategic communication individual to manage your information, and if you allow 
your information to just be linking here and there. It will contradict your policy reform that you are carrying out. That's what uh, uh, work against Professor Tai. I wish he has the opportunity to come back. He will engage and recruit good communication officers. Who will help him to pass out the message? Not necessarily be a member of a uh, Nigerian State of Public Relations. Of, no, someone that can engage media and pass the right information to them, and also do advocacy around the policy they are doing. They they, they didn't do much of public po policy advocacy. Get it? Now, in terms of some of the brilliant projects that you created, I, I happen to be privy and covered a couple of the teacher training mm -hmm. efforts under Professor Tahir Maman. Mm -hmm. The, also the digital center training mm -hmm. hall exactly. which was also commissioned under his watch mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think that he did not re deserve to be outrightly removed much like we saw in the case of the minister of sports who had a new portfolio reassigned to him do you think that with some of the gains he was able to achieve he should have had some reassigned portfolio other than being asked to outrightly leave the office i think one of the issues that could have led to his removal was the appointment of a Board of Governing Council of Universities, uh, rectors for Polytechnic as well. There was an issue that uh, when those appointment lists came out, the state got the highest number. You know, those are political sins against the APC. <laughs> we have to say it. Those are political sins. How could your state get the highest number to the point that the president have to ask you to go and rejig that number? And when you even eventually rejig it, the state is still having much. So, there are political sins that he must have committed. I didn't see his policy in education as being a problem because he was able to manage the industrial crisis in that sector. But where he may could have issues is with the political sins, particularly appointment of a politicians into governing board, which he mis he miscalculated. Then you also look at the issue of the 18 years uh, stuff on jam and rest of them. Those ones on the basis of communication made it to fail. But generally. I saw me top as because of poor management of his communication and information that is being given to the public and how it has been the way it was managed particularly could also is, is the major challenge that he had. But the political scenes we can't isolate it because that governing board, APC members are looking for opportunity to be in those boards. Then before you know it, Jack and Harry, a particular state, I have the highest and a state that is not even an APC. Imagine. So those aspects work against him. But maybe in future we had the opportunity to become Minister again, but you should learn that one, poor communication affects your policy initiative. Then two, you have to play your politics in a way that you do not just jeopardize your activities. Um, I know you are going to talk about the coming people that are coming on board, it, it, but let's just really round up around this education stuff because let, let's start with the education, mm. those coming on board first mm. before we wrap up with education. Mm. Many have lauded Dr. Latunja Lausa. Mm who is replacing the outgoing Professor Tahir Maman mm. as the new Minister of Education. Mm. Do you have any reservations? Do you also tip him as the right man for the job? Uh, for now, uh, he, he, he's good. Every Nigerian that have been chosen or nominated are good for the job. It is when we have the environment of where you are put. Especially with this political dynamics. Exactly. I, I if you don't know how to manage it, for the person coming out, Dr. Uh, what do you mean? Ola Tunja. Ola Tunja. Now, Number one, learn from the mistake of uh, Professor Tai. Number one mistake of Professor Tai, he doesn't have good communication uh, 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 management in the sense that he was not able to manage the communication. And two, he allowed the linkages of critical communication issues of the ministry to be out to the public without managing it. That means he doesn't have a good press engagement or he doesn't have a good uh, people that will help him to manage the, the journalists around because we have a lot of journalists here in Nigeria, yellow journalists, citizen journalists everywhere. So they ju can just pick up one report and that report they can turn into 10 stories with 10 different framing. So if you are, if you don't know how to manage it, you become a challenge. Then three, see, when if he is appointed, if he eventually get to the, see, number one people he has to work with is the union in that academic circle because there is no way you can rate any education minister without first looking out, there are areas of engagement with unions. How many strikes happened? How many industrial actions took place? How many schools closed down because of... Because that is the way we, we can rate them. In terms of their policy initiation, whether they are doing human capital training, like what you say, whether they opened it, nobody wants to know about that. It is the strike. How many strikes happened under your tenure? That's what we, So you must be able to work with the unions. 
Number one, the ASU. ASU, COASU, all the union education sector, ensure that you have, if it's possible, appoint an essay on that regard that will be interfacing with those unions, either at the national level, at the state chapter level, at the local level, because once you have someone who will engage, who interface with this union, the problem will be well dissected. ASU will not go to, 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 to be doing press when they know that they have somebody to relate with on their problem. Kwasu will not do the same thing. ASU will not do it. But when they know that you want to follow through the bureaucratic channel before our information get to you, then they will first go and blow it so that if you don't, if, if anybody will hide the file or hide the letter, you will read it on newspaper. So, Dr. Alausa, if you are hearing us, if somebody close to you, number one, I point if you are if you get to that point, I point a nice relation, essay on nice relation with unions in in those areas, in those sectors. So they can liaise with ASU, Kwasu, so they can reduce the tension of uh, strike and whatever. Because when you die your license and you die your essay is there, before ASU chair president will go to the press, they will tell uh, see, we want your guy to do this thing for us. So he has not been telling us another and uh, they will take take it up. Now, for the other aspect, all those institutions under education, particularly JAM, one of the most controversial agencies under Ministry of Education is JAM. Now, the minister that is coming, work with JAM. Make JAM registration, JAM accreditation, whatever they are doing in terms of admission, make it seamless. Work with the, whoever is in charge. And also develop a critical in, in communication with JAM. Before JAM will go to press and announce any pen, you have an essay they work with. It's not that you are subjecting the the, uh, the register of jam to that person. You want to know because before they go and tell Nigerians, ah, we have ja uh, Jacob Ike uh, jam registration fee to ten thousand naira. Let them discuss it and let it be in a joint press release. The same thing with the one that will be appointed for uh, unions. The other aspect is other institutions like Nigerian University Commission. Nigerian University Commission should work with them. The minister should work with Nigerian University Commission, particularly accreditations. All these areas I mentioned, these are the things that we will use to judge the minister when he finish. Then the money that is being expended on education. Then the issue of curriculum. Then the issue of wages. Then the issue of uh, infrastructure. Then tech phone too, work with them. But for me, if you can work, have someone that you will appoint that will be like a license, an essay on technical issue with the unions, with institutions like JAM and the rest of them, that person will succeed, or Dr. Alausa will succeed. Now, let's also look at some of the other issues away from just uh, the appointment of Dr. Alausa. You have also been one very critical person about the state of affairs in the mm. economy. Mm. Now, there have been reassignments beyond those who have been nominated for appointments. There have been reassignments. I've seen Dr. Doris Uzoka Anite move from the Minister of in Industry, Trade and Investment mm. to now becoming Minister of State for Finance. Mm. Help us explain what you think is mm -hmm. behind President Bola Metinibu's decision to reassign her to Minister of State for Finance, away from industry, trade, and investment. Uh, my particular attention was when she was part of the negotiation committee mm -hmm. on the new, new minimum wage. Mm -hmm. She was one of the most vocal persons exactly. to address the media mm -hmm. in spite of this. And it's coming to me as somewhat of a surprise. Is this also shocking to you or do you see the logic behind it? And there's a logic behind it. There's also... The reason that why the government have to do that because uh, the current minister of uh, finance as well as the uh, uh, minister of economy, he, he has a lot of work on his hand, a big work on his hand. And for minister of state, he will be in charge of relationship between federal government and most of this issue about finance, intervention fund that government is carrying out at the state level. Those are the things we'll be doing. And it will reduce the burden on the current minister so that the work can really go smoothly. Because in that aspect, we have not had someone managing that particular ministry as expected, even though there have been people who manage their office in the past. But maybe the minister, maybe the president wants someone that will be more active and someone who have who have a background in finance to will take care of that. So it's a good one that uh, it, it, there will be a, a reshuffle in that regard. We just wish her the, all the best. And as I said also, she also must manage her communication. The way she was able to manage her communication very well in the of the trade and investment, she should be the same team. To finance to manage our communication very well because one of the key things that uh, a government appointee will be lacking is that when it, it allow this joint and this uh, disarticulation of communication that is coming out of, of our office or your office office when those communication are not managed very well in a way that public can have a sense of belonging 
when a minister or when an agency is making a statement. Without allowing all the orc, shark, and uh, how would I call them, those uh, free beasts uh, uh, online, whatever the media platform they will be, to begin to commercialize those information in a way that will now become they are trendy. Because what is making some of those ministers to fail or government appointees to fail? If your information is not managed well, if you don't have control over the media houses that make use of your information, you will lose it. Because they'll just turn into a commercialization process and they'll begin to trend on it and begin to make it to use it as a form of castigation and abuse or insult on the person. So they have to manage their communication very well. Now, let's look at another redeployment that mm. many Nigerians would have not been privy to but mm. came as a shocker. Mm. Many rating the performance of Senator John Owaneno as Minister of Sports, mm. probably scored him low in the performance of Team Nigeria at Paris Olympics. Mm. But now he's to replace Dr. Doris Uzoka Nete as the Minister of Inter uh, in Industry, Trade and Investment mm. as well. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Is it quite a decision that should have been made? No, no, there's no problem with that. Maybe John Eno, maybe it was a misplaced priority on the part of the president to push him to spot initially. Maybe that could have been his best place to perform, you know, and particularly engaging with stakeholders in the business and trade aspect of the country. On the area of sport, not that he performed poorly in the sport aspect, the challenge that he also had was that he was not able to manage his communication and he was not able to ma manage the engagement with people in that sport area because when he came into that sector, he let people know that he is a novice. Remember, when he came into that sector, he let them know that he's a novice. And everybody knew to not to know much about sports. So maybe this sector that is going now, that's where he, he has his onions, he has everything to bring on the table. And he may do very well. But you should not forget that communication is very important. I, am, I keep stressing the issue of communication because when you're in government or you're in any sector or when you're in a leader or either a department head or unit head, you don't manage the communication that is coming out of your office or the one that your superior gave to you. You just allow people to feed on it anyhow, it will come a challenge to you. They will mix it up with pepper, salt, and whatever, and they will turn it to something else against you. So, managing communication is very effective. That's why I see that the president quickly appoints someone to do as an essay on a public communication and orientation. And I knew the direction of the government is good. I just hope that Mr. Dari will be able to do that. Because public communication and orientation means that you have to educate the people on the policy of the government. On daily basis, you have to be appearing on media and you have to have a strategy to counter unwanted narration about government policy and about what government is saying. Like when uh, Bayo Anuga went to Senate and said the president is a tea pain. People are already calling him a tea pain because his policy is paining people. So he has to come out and say, no, it's not like that. I wish there are someone who also understand how to educate people on policies, not just government policies himself. It will streamline and let people know that when policy comes out, Policy has is positive and negative. Policy can come and dispose of another policy. And that is it. And that's what we are experiencing in Nigeria. So if you don't know how to communicate that aspect to Nigerians, to change the narrative, because like uh, when me and Chijoke were on air last week and we were talking about the senator that uh, NGLA said they found drugs in his house. And I said, this thing, this report was some years ago. Because NGLA I already know that that would help them to generate public sympathy. They say, after we saw drug in your house uh, some years back, when the minister said because uh, the senator said because you people are corrupt, you can see the way they tangle themselves. But the one that gained currency was that they found drug in the man's house, and the man was not able to manage that communication when it comes out. But NGL was able to push that out because most newspapers, most new media houses trained on that. But when you manage that communication and say no, this is not what happened, I gave a narrative to Nigerians on what really happened. Many people will believe you and accept your own narrative as against the other party narrative. And that's what we are saying about communication in government. Communicate appropriately. Use simple languages that people can be well understood and trust you for that. Now, another huge communication, especially with the Nigerian youth, especially mm. in the angle of those who were appointed into Mr. President's cabinet who were mm. classified as young persons. Mm. One of them has sadly been asked to leave, whilst the other has been elevated to replace her. Mm. I'm talking about the outgoing Minister of Youth Development, Dr. Jamila Bayo Ibrahim. Mm. And in her stead, Ijinia Ayodele Aewande has also come in to take up that position. Mm. Many looked at her as being largely very quiet. Exactly, because uh, there are issues. You know, with that particular ministry, there was this 100 billion youth fund. Nobody's talking about it. During Buari time, there was this 70 billion youth fund. Where did the money go? 
Some of those ministers that are out to go, they are not out, asked to go because maybe they didn't perform, but because of there was some political intrigues around what was let into the hand to handle, particularly funding. So you ask yourself, 100 billion was given to you at youth fund. How did you manage it? How did you put this money into process? See, there's so many audio policy reforms. When I mean audio policy reform, I know you understand what I mean. Uh, we had to just do a conference seminar and they say that we don't need such audio policy reform. And that's what is happening mostly in government. And I understand that President Snowball have been able to identify some audio policy reform conferences, engagement that some ministers, some DGs are carrying out. Ah, we are doing this. We are launching this. I don't know if don't, that thing doesn't trickle down to the target population that you're supposed to take care of. I don't know. I, I believe you get what I'm saying. I quite understand. Yeah. So when you now have such people in, in place, like the youth uh, minister that was asked to go, she was doing some audio pro, audio policy program, conference, seminar, the rest of them. That doesn't have a target. You know, President Tinubu, one of his brain uh, target in the Nigerian politics is the youth. The f when he wanted to contest the 2023 general election, the first demography he met in Lagos, at only Stadium, why the youth in Lagos? That's where he first announced his internship or interest. Before he now went to Abel Kuta and said, Emilio Kong stuff. He made it. And he has a target for the youth. Even though some of those youth that are running up and down in those ministries are, are just uh, all these uh, uh, cash and carry youth organizations that we know that they just collect those money and then they don't take it down to the down to the, that it is ready to do. But he has a target. So whoever that is being appointed now, if you are demolished, is taking over, whoever is taking over, please. Ensure that you are not engaged in audio policy reform. Because audio policy reform means that you will collect the money, you announce, you have spent so, so, so millions of naira upon one particular policy, and nobody sees the policy. It's very important we let them know. Those ones that will be going for screening today, Abby, or tomorrow, let them know we don't need audio policy reform in Nigeria. Because audio policy reform means that you just take care of the people that are around you. The money will trickle down to them. But the real effect of the policy, Nobody see. We don't need it. You mentioned in screening before we talk about more ministerial nominees mm -hmm. and those who have been discharged of their duties. We looked at a situation where Southeast lawmakers were kicking against four ministerial nominees from Ogun State, where they said it was against what the 1999 Constitution stands for and some principles of further character to have four ministerial nominees from Ogun State. Mm. It's quite political. Uh, I don't know what would have given rise to that that you're having for ministerial nominee from Ogun State. Maybe definitely President will have to look take a look at it. But we also need to look at uh, the essence of those four. After all, it's Southwest. Why are Southwest people are not complaining about it? That is only Ogun State that is producing four ministers. Although the constitution allow for thirty six, then geopolitical spread allow for additional numbers of ministers. Then those additional numbers of ministers also expect that you should also a equality and so as a spread to bring them out. But maybe based on the merits and criteria that the president is looking for, people who can work with him, people who can deliver, he found a good state. Why did you go to my state? We are both from Lagos State. Why didn't you find four ministers from Lagos State that we all come from? Why didn't you go to our local government, Lagos and Land, that both of us come from? I look for somebody. We went to a good state. I'm not protesting. And if the Southeast people are protesting, they could have justification why they are protesting. protesting. But the thing is that he wants to work with people that he believe that could help him to deliver. People who have integrity, people that can do something and uh, based on his new hope agenda. But that doesn't mean the president cannot look, take a look at it. Maybe to pursue their, their protest issue, add two or three from Southeast so that everybody can <laughs> keep quiet. Because that's what, see, when politicians are making all this money, it is just for them to have their own fair play of a. Uh, the distribution of resources and allocation is not because of the people. Those guys protesting are not protesting because of the mount trekking on a wake road in Nunicha or, or anywhere in Nungu. No, it is because of their person. Now, now let's talk about these demographics, especially in mm. terms of Southeast and the North perspectives. Mm. Now, the last two ministries I'll talk about and the nominees are in perspective of these ethnic perceptions mm. towards different cultural biases. Mm. I would start with one that you would very much understand, much like our viewers. The Office of the Minister of Women Affairs. Mm. The outgone barrister Uju Kennedy Ohanyene mm. had some conflict when she sued the Niger State House of Assembly mm. and petitioned the IG over the marriage of 100 orphan girls mm. in Niger State. Mm. Now, may you talk about 
the cultural bias of having someone who is not from that part of the country understanding what the intent were. She was fighting it from a perspective of human rights. Mm -hmm. And the girls, most likely 18, marriage not being the right step for them to take. Mm. Now, in justifying the solution, the person who is replacing her mm. is now from that ethnic divide. Mm. Former Minister of State for Police Affairs, mm. Iman, Iman Suleiman, Iman. is now the Minister of Women Affairs. Do mm. you think that that bias of such a controversial issue that sparked widespread debates is what has now informed President Bola Metinibus to say, you know what, I'm going to use Iman Suleiman Ibrahim who is a Muslim, who is from that demographics, mm. to deal with the issue of women affairs because predominantly some of the controversial issues affecting women and girls in mm. Nigeria emanates from areas where these sensitive issues surrounding culture mm -hmm. cannot be quite outrightly discussed exactly. from the Western way of looking at it or from the Southeastern perspective of mm -hmm. looking at issues affecting this demographic. Uh, I'm quite interested in that, uh, yeah. Imam is a sociolo sociologist. I think we, both of us were back then in the University of Abuja, then in the University of Abuja, when we were all students. And she's a sociologist. And if you talk about a sociologist, sociologists are humanists. I think that's her background before she now went to study MBA and other degree that she had. That first, I've established her that she may be someone who's rightly fit for that position. Then secondly, when you talk about the religious aspect, that she's a Muslim. Yes, yeah, she's a Muslim from Nasa State. And I don't think that she is that fanatic, that kind of person. She understands issues. I just remember that she was in, she was in uh, what do you call it, a uh, refugee commission before. I think she was also designated to be NAPTI. And she was also essay to a minister. So when I'm trying to point out her background alone to convince that and her pedigree, her pedigree track record over the years. years. To convince that she's not that fanatic and the president may not brought her in for that particular. Then the issue of uh, the Niger State and uh, uh, the former minister then was just ignorant on the part of the state government and whoever put that that put that string. I will still establish it. It is not a religion thing. It was just the belief system of those people there. That they should give out those children, those orphanage girls. He, he said it was part of his constituency project in mm. the House of Assembly to which marry is over 100 to marry, Which is very, very, very wrong. Why need to send them to school or give them better employment opportunity than just if you're marrying them to husband to grand? So that one has been, although we thank God that that has been settled. Everybody have now, all eyes have not opened. The lawmaker in person have now learned his lesson that such is not a constituency project, although you try to paint it with such colors. Now, to the new person that is coming in, I believe she has a track record to make a difference in that ministry. I just hope that she also have the opportunity to manage communication. Because that ministry is one of these big ministries. That means one of the choice ministries. That means one of those ministries that enjoy intervention, funding, not just from federal government, for international donors. That ministry is an eye on international level, particularly UNDP, all those United Nations agencies. So, she has to manage her ministry in a way that her communication has to be very effective and efficient. Then she should be very wary of audio policy reform. I will make mention of it. And those are the areas that where we normally encounter audio policy reform. All those ministries that, are, that work like an intervention ministries, they do a lot of audio policy reforms. We are doing training. We are doing empowerment. We are doing all those are audio. Nobody sees, nobody feels, nobody gets impacted with all those things. She has to be very careful. And these are the these ministries where NGOs, all manner of NGOs will be coming at at her, at a team to solicit for one thing or the other. She has to be very careful because if not, she will sleep. Just like this madam. Because this madam that was removed had issue with the bureaucracy in that ministry. Where they went and spent over fifty million for conference and for whatever they were doing. And the one of the key issues that she raised was that just like I've been saying was that. You are saying you are doing something for people that are fair with women, but there's no rural women in that community. And it went viral. It went viral. It went viral. A lot of people saw that image and, across blocks. And she also had an encounter with uh, people in National Assembly. Because she, she doesn't want to take nonsense from anybody. You get it? So, Imam, as she's coming to that position, be ready. Although you have had the opportunity to work with Minister of Police Affairs, which is lesser, you did less job. Although I commend that she was able to draw some attention uh, of policing to Nasara State. Apart from the training camp that was built, there was also the attention of uh, international agencies to Nasara State on that ministry. But this one is bigger picture. So if anybody close to her is watching us, hearing us, or hearing me, 
advisor, number one, communication. Manage it very well. Number two, avoid audio policy for me because President Tumbo is watching you. EFC is watching. ICB, they are watching you because that ministry will enjoy a lot of intervention. There are some ministries that enjoy a lot of intervention. You see, Minister of Health, Minister of Women Affairs, Finance also enjoy some intervention. Then investment, no, investment doesn't enjoy some intervention like that. The environment. Where I'm saying intervention is that it is not just federal government money that is coming to those means. In money from international organization is coming. <laughs> so they are watching you. So Imam should be very, very careful with audio policy reform. Ah, madam, let us do this initiative. Let us do this conference. Oh, they are coming uh, to collect uh, money. Mr. Uh, uh, Labinikon, hmm. whilst you said uh, interventions, I was already laughing because hmm. uh, my final thoughts and our concluding conversation this hmm. morning is on the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and hmm. Poverty Reduction. Hmm. Controversial enough as things would have it, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Beta Edu mm. suspended for a while, but finally Chief Bayon Anuga did tell the press men and my colleagues that uh, she's gone. Mm -hmm. Now, in her leave of office is now the appointment of Dr. Nantawe Yilwata from Plateau State, who is now supposed to be the new Minister of Humanitarian Affairs. Mm -hmm. The ministry is saddled with several challenges. Mm -hmm. There is a challenge of not having an adequate social register, mm -hmm. national social register, mm -hmm. thereby data for whatever interventions that should be carried out mm -hmm. might not have it's the transparency lacking. level mm -hmm. that we want. Mm -hmm. But that ministry is also a ministry where many Nigerians who benefited from Empire Initiative and mm -hmm. other social welfare initiatives are lamenting its lack of activity. Very well. What does Dr. Nantawe and the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs have to offer Nigerians at a point when a lot of Nigerians have lost trust for the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. First and foremost, you, you must take hold of the nine agencies that are under that ministry. There are key nine agencies under that ministry that were established in recent time. NSI, NSIP, NSIPM, a lot of them that have to do with intervention, GFID, Graduate Internship Program, Empowerment, and the rest of them. You know why that ministry lost focus? But they do allow audio reform policies to come into that ministry because of a uh, role in the election. I really the election was she was one mobilizing most of the youth across the country. Women APC leader. Definitely. And a lot of those guys, when the moment they give her that appointment, they say, Yes, <coughs> this is I our supported time. the election. I so need to have a position in not, the not, not not the opposition. The way the money of that ministry was dismantled in terms of distribution. Cause her the problem to the point that she herself was not using dollar to pay for her installation, dashing dollar to people. That's to tell you how much that ministry is having. Just like the other ministers have mentioned that I enjoy greater intervention, not just the federal government money, but money from outside. The same thing happened to my intervention affair. So, whoever that is coming, the Dr. Yetwa is coming in. Number one, communication. Take hold of the communication. Number two, the agencies, are, there are about nine agencies under you. Take hold of them. Be very, very responsive to issues in those ministries. Then number three, Ensure that you don't allow people to mess up your policies, particularly the civil servant. The civil servant, the bureaucracy, are the problem of government policy implementation. We have to tell ourselves the truth. They are the problem. Because most time when government initiate policies, they want it to get to the grassroots. But one way or the other, they bring their own self-interest, self aggrandizement they kill those policies and they don't allow it to go. So you must ensure that it takes his policies and those policies must be people driven oriented policies, not just policy that is coming, although it is not coming with any new policy. Because humanitarian affairs and poverty, in fact, we already have his templates of what they are going to be doing. And one of the templates, what they'll be doing is that they are going to be generating employment. But ask what employment with humanitarian we want to generate through all those agencies, they are not sustainable employment. Well, number one, they are not creating industries, they are not building cottage factories. So when you see you are creating, you are government want to generate employment with all these agencies, I laugh because it's just audio policy. Those money at the end of the day is just, and you take 200,000, go and start saloon. The palliatives. Then we, Nigerians don't need that. You get it? Although it has come, but for him to be able to enter that ministry and successfully carry out his mandate, is one, we must manage communication, number one. Because communication was poorly managed under Betty Aedu and the other woman. Although the other woman tried. She appointed someone very respectable, somebody as communication uh, chief of staff on communication. And the man managed it very well. Very, very well. Although, at the end of the day, also, 
spill out some things. Get it. So you must appoint someone who know how to manage communication very well. Not necessarily a member of any association, no, but someone who know how to command respect from the media. Because when you have someone appointed as SA media and you command respect from media, you pull all of them together and be able to filter them with right information. And that information can be managed well by those media houses, not all the yellow citizen journalists we see online. Because those ones can turn one report to ten, they can frame one report or one story into twenty. And that's why Nigeria get, and Nigeria don't read details of report. They only read the headline. The headline. So when you have someone that can help you to manage that, it will go along. When they have a technical assistant that also able to manage the institution under you. It's very key. And I believe it will succeed. But everybody's watching. There is slush fund in that ministry. That slush fund, some of them don't have a tag where it will be spent. So if you see those slush fund, please don't take it to. <laughs> well, that's a nice place to leave it. I mm. must appreciate you, Mr. Adifo Lario. Let me link on for your objective position mm. to issues in the news this morning. Thanks for having me.